Today's interview is with Arnie Kowalczyk of Little Falls, Minnesota. Mr. Kowalczyk, um, when and where were you born? I was born here in, in Morrison County, September 7, 1920. I see. Did you, uh, uh, you say you went to state. Um, what, what did you prepare yourself for there? I uh, majored in uh, business education and social studies yes, as a teacher. And you graduated when? I graduated in 1942, spring, or I think it was in either May or June, early June. Tell me about the circumstances of your uh, going into service. Uh, you say you went in the Navy. How, how, how come? Well, at that time, there was a draft, in effect, and uh, the draft board was on my heel. It sent me a notice or so. I had been classified. I think it was, they used to call it 1A, which meant I was eligible physically. I, I for whatever reason, I don't know, I didn't really want to go into the Army, and so I went down and I enlisted in the Navy. I had no Navy experience. I hadn't been exposed really to water or anything, but I just thought I'd try the Navy. Where did you, uh, where did you get your basic training? I went to uh, Great Lakes Training Station at, close to Chicago. What kinds of things did they, did they teach you there? Well, I think the primary objective that they had in mind there was uh, discipline, you know, that you're supposed to respond without question to an order. It was really, as I look back, there really wasn't much that we learned there. Um, we had to salute the uh, chief petty officers. We stood guard over the latrines or heads, you know, just to give us, I guess, the, the practice of standing guard. We, uh, we had inspection every weekend, and it was uh, really thorough housekeeping. We used to steal wool the floors, or we used to have to refer to them as the decks. And uh, God saved the fellow who marked up that deck after it had been steel wool. Uh, so it had to be clean and neat and so on. And we did some things like we had well, we went out uh, with a boat, I know, and rode it one day at the Great Lakes, at uh, Lake Superior, I suppose it would be, and uh, we went out on the range, I think, one day, firing rifles, old Springfield Army World War I rifles. And we, of course, learned to march, right face, left face, about face. And we'd probably take a day or so we were supposed to learn uh, Oh, Morse code, but it really never got enough training so that we were really good at it, you know, the Navy has various flags that designate certain things, we, I suppose we view that, some seamanship. But, uh, not much naval stuff, really. Not really much naval stuff, no. Where did you go from Great Lakes? From Great Lakes, I went to the, um, I went to school at uh, Lakehurst, New Jersey. There was a naval air station there, lighter than air. They used to have, send out these uh, blimps. Uh, which were doing uh, submarine patrol along the east, eastern seaboard. And they also had a parachute packers school there. And we had this school work for horologists. And that's what I did. It was, uh, I think, a three month course. How did you manage to get into aerography? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I didn't. Uh, they told me in a recruiting station that with my background in business, that's the area of being maybe a storekeeper or something of that nature, but uh, I was assigned to this school of virology and I asked, I remember I asked the uh, petty officer there who was in charge of our company what that was, and he said, damn if I know what that is. He didn't know what virology was. I looked up in the dictionary and it said something about uh, upper atmosphere and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be up in a balloon and I did not want to do that. <laughs> and I finally found out though it was really uh, what we call meteorology. Uh, but the emphasis would be, you know, on weather forecasting for um, well, aviation meteorology rather than land. You see, and so they maybe call it aerology, but it's really meteorology. What kinds of courses did you take during that trip? Well, we had to study just, uh, well, meteorology. We had to learn all the clouds. And then we had to learn to enter what they call the synoptic weather charts uh, using symbols which would designate various meteorological conditions. Uh, you know, you would put in a little pattern. Every 
six hours they would make a synoptic chart and weather observations would be taken all over simultaneously at that time and then they would be sent over by teletype and from those teletype um, sheets we would make out a synoptic chart or a weather chart and then you draw in the fronts and the isobars and, and then uh, on the basis of that make a forecast and, uh, which of course is really quite different from the way it was done aboard ship that's mm -hmm. the way you learn so your training then wasn't wasn't all that applicable to what you what you would do after you got on board ship. Well, it it was you know uh, if you were you see if you'd had duty if I'd had duty aboard an aircraft carrier for instance there would be a different emphasis than aboard a battleship. But as I said the compliment call for one aerographer aboard a battleship. And, I mean it, I didn't seek it or anything I just was assigned. How long were you at uh, Mayfair's? I think it was a three-month course. It's very. Um, I didn't really have uh, enough science and math to to do well. I had to work hard there. I worked. It was a tough course for me. Were there quite a few people in the school with you? Or well, I think we had a class of over thirty, and I don't recall. I mm -hmm. think they probably had about three classes going through. And the fellow in charge, uh, he ran a very, as you say, tight ship, uh, and the discipline was tough. If you, uh, we had a couple of fellows I know were caught cheating. We had uh, we had Marines in the back of the room whose job was to maintain discipline, <laughs> and uh, they were caught cheating, and that's the last we saw them. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't even last the course. The next day we didn't see them anymore. Supposedly, I guess you know the rumor is they sent them out to sea. You know, there was there's a easy motivation in places like that. You know, how do you motivate a student? Well, if you don't make it here, we ship you out. You know, so. Um, but I graduated about in the middle of the class. But I was not a top student there. We had some individuals, for instance, who had washed out of aviation school, who were students there. And we had some lawyers, I know. We had a lawyer had a tough time, tougher than I did. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was kind of a tough school for me. I didn't have enough science. Do you think they might have chosen you for that because of your college degree? Oh, that probably had something to do. They gave us a whole battery of tests. I know, you know, Great Lakes. And, uh, probably on the basis of that, I don't know. But certainly, my background in science and math wouldn't be one thing that would lead them to conclude that I would be a logical candidate mm -hmm. for school in neurology. But mm -hmm. I, I liked it. Uh, later on, I had an opportunity to go to officer school as a well a storekeeper, a supply officer. And I turned it down, and I got balled out for that from the officer, but <laughs> I liked it. What did, uh, did you essentially do that kind of work at Anacostia? Well, Anacostia there, we, uh, really our job was to uh, give clearance to the airplanes leaving, and Anacostia at that time, when I was there, was really a, a, a naval air station more or less for the convenience of uh, Navy brass or officers. There's a lot of admirals coming in and out of Washington, D.C., of course. And uh, our job was to tell them about the weather conditions they would encounter, whether or not they could fly into Pittsburgh or wherever. Was there a, a section then, or we, of, of air, air office? Yes, or? we worked in the <clears throat> control tower with the uh, people who actually gave the clearance. We had assigned a clearance sheet indicating that weather was satisfactory. If they'd had uh, instrument training and so on, had been checked out for that, you know, that was one situation. If they didn't have, that would be another. And whether there was instrument uh, you know, capability at the airport they were going and so on. So that's a, there wasn't really much military activity, you know, in uh, the Washington Anacostia. It just was not. In its early days, I guess it was kind of an experimental. It was just an experimental with their you know, with, uh, Navy aircraft. But at the time I was there, it was just really, as I say, more or less for the convenience of Navy officials. What was it like living in wartime Washington? Did you get out much? Oh, it was a great liberty town. Um, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about that. What? Well, you know, there's a. Uh, in terms of proportion, there are many more females or women than men. There is, you would seldom find uh, 
if you go to USOs or wherever, or whatever bar, or wherever, a, a native Washingtonian, they were from some place, you know. And of course, it was easy to get acquainted. You say, "Well, where are you from?" And if they said Minnesota, it was you know, it's like old home week again. So you met somebody from Minnesota there. So that yeah, was a great town for liberty. And was there quite a bit to do? Oh yes, you know, a lot of places to visit. Uh, I know we visited Congress once. I had a friend there, James Kelly, Seamus Kelly, and uh, we used to go to. Senate and listen to the Senate. Sit up there. Listen. Oh, it was a fine liberty town. How long were you in Washington? I was there, well, let's see, I think about a year and uh, I think I left in March, maybe about a year and two or three months. About you left in March 44. Yeah. Did you, did, you, did you request duty aboard the uh, Texas or were you just oh, assigned no. there? No. No. I mean, I. Uh, they began to get waves, and then you know it was apparent that <clears throat> we were going to get shipped out, and then that the waves were going to replace uh, men in air stations like Anaconda. So we got sent for about three months, I think, to Quonset Point, uh, Rhode Island, uh, and I was. Listening. They had various. Uh, Units operating out of there. They used to have a transport outfit operating out of there. They had. Uh, they used to have a school. At the time they, uh, for uh, Navy pilots, they had a, a structure, something like a flight deck of uh, an aircraft carrier, and these pilots would come in and practice landings and takeoffs. And I was attached to the Fleet Air Wing uh, Headquarters Squadron, which. I don't know why. We had uh, all kinds of orographers there. There really wasn't much work to do, and every unit had their own orographers. So I had a lot of liberty there, too, but I was only there about two months, I think. And then I went up to, uh, I got duty aboard the Texas, and I went up to Boston and until, I guess, they found where it was, and it uh, located it, or it was anchored at Casco Bay, Maine, and I went there and finally got aboard it. And I wait, and I I went there one, took a train up there, and I couldn't go aboard because there's a heavy fog, and finally got me aboard. Sometimes in the middle of the night, took me aboard. And you went from there over to directly over to Europe. Well, we took a convoy. We went down to New York, I guess, and then we ultimately took a convoy across of uh, well supplies and troops to uh, British Isles. We went to. Ireland and anchored there and then uh, we had an interval of about uh, I guess two months we just rehearsed and uh, for the invasion we really didn't know what was going to happen we weren't told but you could anticipate something like that was going to come we worked with uh, we'd have French sailors aboard and and British sailors aboard and uh, the problem really is as far as I could observe, and were really with uh, communications, you know, they had radio men and, and probably in other departments they'd have uh, maybe gunnery too, I don't know, but up on the navigation bridge where I was, I had communications. They'd have Frenchmen aboard. What, uh, so essentially they were training, is that? It was rehearsal, yeah, with various groups and uh, we'd, uh, We'd work with the uh, British ships uh, communicating and maneuvers, and, um, and I don't really know. They never told us the details of mm -hmm. what we were doing. What was your particular role here during this? Well, during that, uh, I would uh, make out my weather map, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I got a canned weather map. I got it from Weather Central. Uh, it came into the radio room, and uh, I had, my biggest job was to break the code because all of that came in code. And so I had a code book and then I would break the code and then it was from a series of, all the data broke down into numbers, just a long tape and it was just a series of numbers and that, depending upon its position, would tell you the latitude and longitude of the various fronts and isobars. They'd give you one or two isobars or, you know, the lines indicating uh, atmospheric pressure and you draw that in. And then from that, you'd, you'd kind of observe local conditions, 
and then make a forecast. And of course, if it wasn't accurate, you could always say, well, it wasn't good to start with. <laughs> <laughs> the weather mean? data was really a, a scarce commodity. So all weather moves from west to east. We had the advantage, we, the, you know, the Allies in, in, in the Atlantic, and uh, the Germans, for instance, used to have uh, observers, they used to land submarines and so on along Greenland, I guess, in Iceland. And try to get some readings. Mm -hmm. Try to get some mm -hmm. readings. You see, and, and when you were going, of course, you couldn't, uh, you had to maintain radio silence. You, know, you couldn't give uh, atmospheric conditions or meteorological conditions in route. So you break radio silence and you could find you with your subject. Yeah. So um, I did that, and, and when we were really engaged in combat, then my duty was to be up in the navigation bridge, and I was, uh, well, I was a talker, really. I had a set of headphones, and, and I would get reports from radar and from um, the crow's nest and uh, various places and shit, and I would report that to the captain or executive officer or navigator or whoever it was on the bridge. What kind of information would this be like? You know, well, sightings or uh, yeah, what mm -hmm. they sighted and mm -hmm. uh, uh, if there were any objects. And you just reported what you saw. If you saw a ship off so many degrees off starboard or port bow, well, you, you reported it. Verbally. Verbally, right. That's right. Your first uh, time at sea really was in your, was in your trip. That's correct. So tell me about that. What was that time board duty like? Well, it was totally new, uh, living aboard ship. The Texas is an old ship. It was built, uh, well, just before World War One, I, I guess. And so uh, it was rebuilt then again and to accommodate all the new devices. And it started out as a coal burner, and they had it fitted with uh, you know, facilities to hold oil. And uh, I had to put radar on and et cetera and a lot of things. And so it did not ride well. It, it tended to wallow around. And uh, it was uh, below decks. So you know, it was very close quarters, it would seem. You know, it wasn't <laughs> wide open. You had little uh, passageways you went through. You had to go up the ladders and through the hatches and so on. It was a different kind of environment. So. As I said, I lived uh, on a navigation bridge in a little room, so I was not quite so in such a small quarters, but not the place we lived, but it was more open. You could open the door and there you were outside. So it was totally different. And uh, but you're, you had a small little locker, and you put all your belongings in there. It was probably about, what, I don't think it was two feet, maybe 18 inches by 18 inches by two feet. You had to learn to roll your uniform and <laughs> put them in there. And so um, we lived in small spaces. Where, uh, you said the weather was pretty rough? Going over, yes. Yeah. So you know, you go the northern route. Up around Greenland, and right, and you do that you know, because it's probably the distance, and then because you did get some air cover from Greenland and Iceland, and then we had planes out patrolling. Yeah, it was a rough voyage for me. I was subject to seasickness. I got to be kind of the joke of the ship. Tell me about that, you, because <laughs> <laughs> it isn't too painful. <laughs> well, I missed a lot of meals, and I used to get around it by uh, not eating. Eventually, though, every time I went out, I'd get sick. I'd, I'd feel sick. And you went out outside? You know? No, no, no. I mean, after we left port. Oh. You know, we'd leave New York and go out into the open sea. And if there was any roughness at all, I would get sick. And then maybe after 18 hours, 24 hours, I'd begin to feel better. The only place I never got sick was in the Mediterranean, which is kind of like a big lake. Mm -hmm. get sick there. And this one was particularly rough. We rolled in the time. And our scene, it was in March, I guess, or February, I don't know, March, I guess, or April. It was, it was rough. And so uh, when I felt it, uh, well, I just didn't eat. It wouldn't stay down anyway. There was no medication or anything you could be given? I think I, I don't think I could have endured a small ship like a destroyer. I don't think I could have handled that. So there was a relative, relative amount of stability in the battleship. Oh yeah, 
uh, rode a lot more uh, steadily and even than a destroyer. They used to come alongside us to refuel, you know, they'd be bobbing up and down. They'd be riding all along. They used to, they used to refuel down. So the lines across and hose. Where did you, uh, where did you dock in England? We really didn't dock in England. Uh, we anchored outside uh, Belfast. Belfast. Okay. So you could look at a big high hill, you know, see, a, see the Emerald Island, truly emerald green. You weren't there very long, probably, before the invasion, were you? Well, uh, probably about two months. All we did, I say, is rehearse, and then we went. And, you know, they, they delayed that for 24 hours, that invasion. So we, we started down, and really, you know, all these ships, as far as you could see, these landing craft and so on, and then we made a 180 degree turn and went back the same way again. Turned around and came back again so we could delay it because of the weather, it was so rough. The beach was so rough. And of course, it still amazes me that the Germans didn't uh, spot that. So you actually headed out from Belfast and had to go back? Well, I don't know. We, we rendezvoused someplace. Yeah, we headed out of Belfast and met up with the rest of them. And you'd go along, you'd meet more and more. Landing craft. And, uh, we were a battleship division. We had, I think, three battleships with us, or a couple cruisers probably, and about maybe half a dozen destroyers. And so you were, you were in the Texas off, off Omaha Beach? Yes. D-Day. Yeah. What, what, what are your impressions of what you remember of that day? Well, it was a uh, drizzly, cold, <laughs> gray day. Uh, we, uh, we were approaching in the dark, and I guess the thing that sticks in my mind is uh, from the crow's nest, you know, I was wearing the earphones, the fellow said, well, we had mine sweeps going ahead of us, and they had uh, small little lights that you could just see them, you know, they no big lights, but little, so you could see where they were, and they were supposed to be sweeping uh, an opening for us, to remind you. And the fellow said, uh, uh, appears to be a mine dead ahead. Well, <laughs> we just stood there, you know, well, nothing happened, but, you know, everybody was waiting for, for, um, for mine to go off if we'd ever uh, run into it, I suppose. But we, we made it and uh, dropped anchor. We anchored, you know, which in itself was a uh, sitting duck then. But we were old battleships, and I guess they considered us to be expendable. We, you know, we not the Missouri, the Wisconsin, the mm -hmm. island class. And we just over fire. It must have been a, a, an awesome thing to be on a deck of a big ship on the well, those huge <laughs> shells. I guess it, you could use that term, yes. Did you actually see the landing craft going in? Oh yeah. They go right by. Feel sorry for them. It's rough. Water seasick. Did you have any contact with the with the soldiers when you were on board ship? Well the only contact we had really is, is uh, when we were after the war was over we took some back from uh, well, I don't know, Hawaii to the West Coast. We, you know, our galley was running 24 hours a day. They were just mm -hmm. eating 24 hours a day. You know. yeah. That's about it. Uh, but other than that, uh, how long were you? Uh, how long were you uh, in that area after the invasion? You mean around the uh, around English Channel? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we were there, I would guess, about three weeks or a month. We uh, had to go back to Plymouth, England and get patched up. So we took a shot, as I said, on the destroyed our bridge. Yeah, there. would you tell me about that? We didn't, we didn't get that on, well, on the uh, tape. We were given a target around Cherbourg uh, to shell, and uh, the Germans uh, shot back. They were straddling us, and, and we took one shell uh, on top of the conning tower, which the force then was upward, and it damaged or blew out the deck of the navigation bridge. Where were you then? 
I had just left. I missed being a casualty by about 20 minutes. And I was in my bunk down below. And uh, I remember we had the lights on and uh, all the light bulbs just popped. You said the Mediterranean was pretty, pretty calm. Huh? I'm calm. <laughs> I'm all right. Um, and there was a great deal of dust. Yeah. And uh, well, then uh, stretcher bearers came and so on. And um, well, that's about it. There were some fires on deck, and uh, then we went back to um, Plymouth, England. Did you get much shore duty or shore time there? Not there, stage? no, no. There really isn't anything, you know. There really wasn't anything you could do with shore. You know, mm. yeah, Plymouth itself was uh, all bombed out. There's nothing there but a shipyard and. Uh, it was really total devastation. Uh, excuse me, I'll be fine. We'll go and shut that off. Desolation. Uh, there were, you know, blocks of just bombed out areas. And, uh, so there really wasn't much to do on Liberty. You know. mm. I, went, I went ashore once. I remember seeing that little girl and she didn't have any hands. Oh my. And I suppose if I'd had a picture, you know, that would have been a picture of the year, but uh, this little girl there, I know her face is dirty. And my family, my father's family was in the during yeah. World War II. So, um, yeah, there wasn't really much to do. I know we used to give the workmen their um, sugar. I really appreciate it. For the tea time, the tea know, time uh, sure. precisely at tea time, no matter what, they had their tea, <laughs> and we used to give them sugar, and they'd appreciate that so much. So you went then from there to, uh, to southern France, and you, yeah. you, what, you supported the, uh, the invasion? Yeah, uh, that was really uh, not much of an invasion in terms of a military effort. You know, the Germans, I guess, had accepted retreat, I think, even before we got there. You know, I don't think we were there only one day, I think. It was, it was there a naval bombardment? Oh, yes, we the did, yeah. Standard operating procedure, yeah, I guess. Right. Did you, you didn't have, did you have any liberty in, in the Mediterranean at all? Yeah, uh, well, we went to Toronto, I know, went to Italy, and uh, we had, I remember, um, a meal with an Italian family. I guess they used to make a little extra money that way. And, uh, there were still Germans. Uh, we couldn't stay there overnight. You know, to, but the board ship, you know, liberty. What were you doing there? Just kind of... Uh, I don't know. We were probably waiting for supplies or something. Uh, you know, this was after southern France. Yeah. This must have been August of 44. Yeah. But you managed to uh, participate in two pretty important engagements in the Pacific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, describe your trip from, uh, from the Mediterranean into the Pacific? How did, you, how did that go? Well, we went back to New York, and uh, we were there for... Uh, I suppose uh, three weeks or more than that, maybe five weeks. And then I had liberty, came home, leave. Did you have a full, did you have two weeks leave? Or yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Two weeks leave. And uh, 
the ship, of course, was in, in, in the shipyard, and they were replacing the guns and doing various repairs. And, uh, and they put in bigger guns or? Well, newer. Newer. Yeah. The bore or the barrels, I guess, were pretty hard on all leaned out. Yeah. And so uh, it took a while, and uh, during that time, uh, well, uh, life aboard ship really wasn't so good because, you know, this. You had to go off the ship for toilet facilities. The water was shut off. So they, I went to a Floyd Bennett Airfield temporarily. And I was supposed to be on duty there, but the fellas there never gave me any work to do. <laughs> Where, so no, I had this air base? Uh, it's in New York. I've never heard of that. Uh, well, I don't know, maybe it doesn't Probably function. doesn't. Yeah. But there's a naval air station there. And. Uh, so I had a lot of liberty. Yeah. It must have been an interesting time to be in during wartime. Huh? It was. Well, more kinds of things to see. Yeah. <laughs> New York, you know, country boy. Because I'd been in New York, I'd gone there a couple of times from Lakers, New Jersey. But, you know, a strange thing though, you know, you'd ask the natives, we were around Brooklyn, and you'd ask the natives, how to get to uh, Manhattan someplace, and they'd all say, well, I don't know. Hmm. I always thought New York was, was more you know, kind of a provincial existence there. They knew their own block and their own neighborhood. And that was they about much about the rest of New York. Did you, uh, you must have been thrown together with an awful lot of people, awful lot of men who weren't from your part of the country. Oh, yeah. What was, what was your reaction to that? Well, you know, most, Fellas are nice, most people are nice, but I think when I was, <laughs> I can recall being in boot camp and uh, we, 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 mostly from Minnesota, not boot camp, but before we, yeah, in boot, no, I'm sorry, it was in boot camp. Well, one of the barracks we were there, and we were mostly Minnesotans, maybe a few from Wisconsin, and the other end was a group from Kentucky, Tennessee, and that's a different breed, you know? They, <laughs> I think they had more fun, you know, they used to do a, Singing, they sang all the time. They sang, you know, what you'd say, hillbilly songs. Mm -hmm. Had a great time. So you were certainly aware of regional differences. Oh yes, I became, you know. Uh, uh, and in in Washington D.C., uh, when I was stationed there at Anacostia, I think that's the first time I really became aware of blacks as a group. And you get aboard a bus, and there was just this beginning, I think, of the agitation there. And you'd see little uh, confrontations between blacks and whites as to where they were to be on the bus. And some of the blacks were beginning to get so-called uppity. How are you going to go back there? You're talking about civilians here. Civilians, that's right. Uh, was there any particular group of... Uh, Oh, he was talking about, uh, about the uh, people from Kentucky and Tennessee. Were there any, any particular regional groups that you found uh, less easy to get along with or less compatible with, say, someone who grew up in, in rural Minnesota? I don't believe so. No. They were, uh, well, you know, I, when I was in Washington, D.C. again, a fellow working with me, he was from North Carolina. I remember he'd say once or twice, he'd say, uh, let's go on Liberty. And I never really wanted to go on Liberty with him because he'd say, well, what do you want to do? He said, well, let's go pick a fight with some niggers. Oh, and that was his idea of, of, of Liberty. Well, that wasn't my idea. <laughs> and uh, so I, I never did do it. That was not my idea. Well, it must have been. But I could get along with him. He's really a nice fellow, you know. You know, some people would say, well, he wasn't a nice fellow, but, you know, in between your own, the two of you, you know, was it, uh, was it awfully hard, you say you went on liberty, uh, when you were home, was the, uh, was the thought of going back pretty constantly on your mind? Well, well I got from home so. for two weeks, and, you know, I think you just accepted that. Did you have no. a good time? Where? You came home on, on Liberty? Oh, yes. Yeah. 
not only at home, but uh, once you got past Chicago, I mean, you were, you'd order a meal in a restaurant, I know, in St. Paul, and the waitress would say, well, it paid for it. Is that right? Yeah. There'd be some fella at another table. Really made you feel real special, really, you know, real special. And uh, in Minneapolis, when you got aboard a train, you know, the service men first because trains were packed. Uh, once you got beyond Chicago, you were on your own, though. Yeah, there was so many of them. But no, you know, Minneapolis, St. Paul, you went into a bar. Right? First thing you know, there's a drink in front of you. Not like, not like Vietnam. Was I guess not, no. Tell me about your, uh, uh, your trip then to the South, to the Pacific. Well, we, uh, after we got, uh, we left New York, we went through Panama Canal, and we, I remember we stopped in California, probably San Diego or San Francisco, and we went, and we went to Hawaii. And we pick up some ships along the way and so on, and then we uh, went, as I said, out to these little coral reefs, you lift, it's close to an island called Yap. Yeah, I know, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's just above the equator. I never did cross the equator. And uh, we took on provisions and ammunition, and we headed for Iwo Jima. And your, your duty there was essentially the same yeah. as it was. Yeah, it was a different, though, you know, a little different, I'd say. And, and uh, these kamikazes were a problem, especially in Okinawa. I guess there was a bigger spirit of uh, desperation. Mm -hmm. by that time. <clears throat> but what do, you, what do you recall of, the, of your, uh, your duty around the world? What sticks in your mind about that? Well, we just were firing. I guess uh, really what sticks in my mind are the Marines going ashore. You can see tough going to get a pair of field glasses on. You can see they didn't have any reason to climb it. No, they, they really didn't. <laughs> but Okinawa, you said, was, was the roughest. In Kamikaze, yes. Yeah. What I think Okinawa was, as I remember reading back there, there was more casual people in the Navy than there were sure. in the Sure. Yeah. Um, we didn't ever got hit. I, I attribute that to, uh, I suppose, luck. And we had a captain who, uh, I suppose some would say hard-nosed, but uh, we were at general quarters, I think, for, God, what was it, 50 days or 90 days or something. The gun crews stay right by the guns. The inter aircraft. You know, we had an inter aircraft battery right outside that nav office. You know, it was going on all the time. And we had what they call a TBS, a talk between ships above our door. And you could hear. And the thing was, we were talking all the time. So it was very noisy. Were you, um, were you actually a visually aware of all the kamikazes buzzing around? Well, you could see them. Yeah. We were uh, targets a number of times. Yeah, sure. What was the, uh, what were your personal feelings at that time? Terrified or? No, I don't know, you don't, gee. Well, I don't know, I wasn't. I wasn't. Did, you, did you feel under a great deal of stress at that time? I don't know you felt it, but I noticed uh, it's the first time, and I think it was in Okinawa, that I used to wake up and I'd be grinding my teeth. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know why. Mm -hmm. I suppose it was stress. Yeah, you couldn't get any sleep, you know. Mm -hmm. The guns were going all the time. Now, I was, maybe you saw the segment, you ever watched the World at War series? It used to be. Mm -hmm. I don't recall it. Sir Lawrence of Liberty used to know it. Right. There's a naval officer there who said that he supposed that, that being in, he was at Okinawa, being under kamikaze attack was probably the most stressful of any kind of, of naval, you know, naval Well, it, it required, it demanded, uh, particularly from the gun crews, a great deal of discipline. Yeah. And 
As far as I know, we never had a gun crew that left the band that took over positions. And that's probably part of the reason why we never took a hit. I used to hear reports of other ships that we did. They just they left. Break. Yeah. And, After uh, so much time, we just. I never, um, I never was on a gun crew, but uh, I never heard of any of ours doing that. Well, when at Okinawa, for example, as you were as you were getting these messages, from, what kinds of messages were they? I mean, what, 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 were, what were you being oh, told that you ships? had to relay? Oh, uh, what I? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. really nothing when we were anchored much. It was uh, while we were maneuvering around and so on that you know, once you were anchored, well, it wasn't really much to say. You had your radar. And, mm -hmm. Well, did you get news? Did you get news of kamikaze sightings or anything like that? Or well, yeah, yeah. but you get it aboard uh, you know, via these TBSs too. You know, some ship would report. You know, I don't know what the range of these key talk between ship was. Would really. mm -hmm. say, well, <coughs> you know, one of the ships farther out there would say that as kamikaze. The ships that really took a beating were the uh, the picket ships. The picket ships. Yeah. Out of the outer rim, the destroyers, they took a beating, much more beating. What was, uh, you think, you're thinking back over, over, your, over your years in the Navy, um, what was it that, about that experience that were particularly frustrating to you? Did you find certain kinds of frustrations were you in mean? your job? Well, the things that you remember you in the uh, military service have simply been frustrated. Uh, um, made you angry. Well, I don't know. No. I can't think of anything. I can't think of anything, really. Well, I remember I had uh, one service and frustrated him the most was not being able to get any mail. You know, the good kind of you know, this kind of thing. That's well, I think we got mail reasonably well. Uh, you know, when, when the mail ship would come alongside, that was a big, big day. But uh, maybe it would feel more, I don't know what branch he was in. Yeah, he was in the infantry. Yeah, you know, maybe on land you felt more that way. But. See, what I'm trying to do here is get some idea of yeah. what life was like on board, you know, on board. Well, ship. it was long intervals of just, I tell you, just plain board and board. <laughs> You'd sit and read. Nothing to do. Mm -hmm. Nights, you know, you couldn't have lights on. Did you hear any broadcast from Tokyo Rose? Oh, sure. What kinds of things did she talk about? Well, I don't really remember the details. Remember. But, uh, <laughs> I don't think it had any impact. Well, that's I talk to people who access Sally and yeah. things of that kind. Yeah. I think they seem to find it more amusing than yeah, anything else. I don't think it had any impact in terms of turning uh, somebody against uh, the government. It had that impact at all. What was, uh, was, was, there, was there quite a bit of, of stiff discipline on board your ship? I'm talking about the relation between enlisted men and officers. Was it? No, I don't think so. I never. Uh, had that experience, I think it, uh, see a lot of the officers really were, uh, when I was aboard the Texas, I think we had a really good crew, and they were, uh, well, mature fellows, mm -hmm. they were fellows who'd been in business and various things, in the officers, so, you know, they were, had responsible jobs by then, they were in their 30s probably, so. and, uh, they probably didn't hold to a lot of military formality that your West Pointers would. Uh, I don't know, I got along with them, they didn't. Uh, I think once you got aboard ship, you know, you kind of forgot the boot camp mm -hmm. <laughs> atmosphere where you had a snap to salute and so on. Uh, our captain was a uh, this is a rather strict fellow, but I thought he was, you look back on it, and then you probably thought he was being unfair and all that, I, you know, I think you have to, well, I think discipline is something that's really required. 
under conditions like that. You can't have a great debate and discussion on it. <laughs> it's, well, that's right. Uh, what should be done or what was in unjust. Or, you know, food was, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the conditions at time, our food was decent enough. We ate uh, rations, uh, hay rations or whatever, when we couldn't have the galleys going. Uh, Food wasn't terrific all the time, but as, you know, as when we were in Port, we had good food, reasonable food. At sea, well, it just wasn't available. You accepted that. Uh, I know we got flour once around the Philippines that had bugs in it. But the medical officer said, "Well, there really isn't any harm in it. Uh, eat it if you want, or don't eat it if you don't want." I ate it. Weevil, squeeze, that's right. Sure. Raisin bread, we used to call it. <laughs> <laughs> what kinds of what kinds of humorous things do you remember about about your methods? Things that kind of tickled you or incidents? Well, I think just some of the I don't know if they were keen here or not, but some of the expressions that were, were, were rather regional. Uh, people I had. There was a difference between Southerners, for instance, it's the way they talk. What they taught was good food. Like what? Well, the grits, comedies. <laughs> I'd never heard of that. <laughs> They'd wish for that, and I didn't really know what they'd talk about. And of course, uh, just the characters you'd meet sometimes. Uh, my friend and I, I don't know if you want to hear this or not. But sure. It's my unforgettable character. Sure. In Washington, Anacostia, D.C. We, at the end of the bus line that took us from the station to, what you'd say, downtown, there was a little tavern, which was a great place to meet. See, and you had your first bottle of beer there, I suppose. I had a friend, James Kelly, who was from uh, Philadelphia, a true Irishman, Seamus Kelly, he used to call him. Seamus. And we met this character. He was older than we were, and he, in a sense, didn't have a neck in terms of dimension. He was just like the head going straight down, squat, and he had tattoos. If you wanted a stereotype of a, of a stereotype of a real Navy man, he would get it. And somehow he got a light. Seamus was very friendly. James was very, Jim Kelly was very friendly. We struck up a conversation, and he was telling us all kinds of things. And we went down to Washington, D.C., and uh, he was telling us that, uh, well, what he was really looking for, he had a kind of a raspy voice. What he was really looking for was a fight with some Marines, you know, which <laughs> I didn't really want to do, you know, and I don't think Kelly did either. But uh, he was very polite to all the ladies. And, uh, Says, well, you know, he says, I don't dare throw any rocks at kids who might be my own. But <laughs> well, he was a character, and he had a lot, lot of bills. I don't know how much money he had. And he was telling us, that, uh, well, the reason I like the Navy is because I like to fight. Uh, he told us later then that he was in Washington, D.C. to get a medal for bravery down in Sicily. Well, we thought he was just uh, a lot of hot air. You know. We left him, and when he went down to the train station to sleep, he was going to sleep on a bench there uh, in the railroad station. Well, about a month or so later, we found a Navy magazine, and there was his picture, and the guy was giving a medal from Frank Knox, who at the time was Secretary of Navy. And he was no phony at all. But he was, uh, you know, if you want to, uh, Hollywood could never create a, a Navy character truer, you know. That was it, the epitome of what an old Navy guy was. And he'd been a Navy for a long time. Oh, yeah, he says, I've been busted more times than I've had here in the Navy. He was still a seaman. <laughs> <laughs> and he had stripes, you know, the hash mark. And he had a tattoo, and he had the swagger. He had everything. Did you ever find out what happened to him? 
No, I don't know. He got the medal, and I don't know what happened to him. He just loved to fight. Was there a... I answer? guess he's right, you know. Love my life. Was there quite a bit of competition and animosity between sailors and marines? Did you, or was it just mostly talk? Oh, I think if you animosity between anything else, I think it was sometimes just a result of the boredom. Yeah, there was. But for instance, when we used to go on, um, we used to get to shore leave, you know, in the Philippines, we'd, we'd each get our ration of beer, two cans of beer, you know, and there might be uh, two, three ships there, you know. Usually there, there, the fight would break out between the crews of two ships. I think it was just part of liberty. <laughs> Somebody would call a name, you know, somebody from another ship would call a name and put that answer. Pretty soon there's a contact pretty soon the NPs were separated. So there was there was really competition between ships too. Oh probably. well, you know, I think it was just part of liberty, yeah. You know, you never knew anybody over there. You know, you just call a name, they of course call you back and pretty soon. <laughs> they had a brawl going. Probably was only from the boredom you think yeah. of sea duty. Yeah, I think so. I never got involved with him. I was still in silence, sissy. I stood on the <laughs> sidelines and watched it. Do you think um, the war changed you? And did the, how did the war affect you, do you think? Oh, I think, yeah. I think I was uh, just the uh, exposure to, I say, other people in other parts of the country. Yeah. Do you have any resentment? Or regrets about your military service? No, I think it was necessary. I, I have some different kind of feeling about Vietnam. So. Well, how, how, how did you feel, say, during the Vietnam War? And I ask this to most oh, I political. And I well, no, I was, I'm just yeah, saying. No, no, I don't mind yeah. saying it, but it, you know, I just can't see why we were there. I don't see any reason. I think Granada was dumb. Olivia was ridiculous, and I don't think young people really know that. When, uh, if, if, uh, if the war was bad, what's the next one going to be like? You know, I think some of these people here got the image that it's going to be in the United States like it was during World War II, maybe. You know, you came back home and they didn't going on here. Things were really nice in the States, you know, other than the gas rationing and a little shortage of sugar. And what meat. was there? Sure. It was great. Oh, it was not that way or whatever. What was your reaction having, you know, been in the Navy and doing the war itself? What was your reaction to the, to the young men who refused to serve? Your, how did you well, I don't know. You mean during World War II? No, no, I mean during, during Vietnam. Well, I thought maybe they were most sensible. I really could not see any purpose for them. So you had no resentment toward them or feelings toward them going no, to Canada? I think, or uh, in some instances, civil disobedience is justified. What, you know, so we pulled out of Vietnam, and so what's the difference? What difference has it made? Hegemony of communism in Sweden, the whole Pacific area, anyway. They've got enough trouble with the world. Terrible. Pride or what? Let them, let them, let go. 